This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. The photographer behind one of the world's most iconic photographs, Steve McCurry, on this edition of Conversations. It's been said a picture is worth a thousand words. If so, Steve McCurry is a novelist. His photographs have captured stories that only the eyes can tell. Somehow McCurry allows his camera to reveal emotions that go way beyond the image. His most famous photograph is that of a young Afghan girl. You know the picture well. Those captivating eyes speak volumes, yet hide so much. That famous photograph appeared on the cover of National Geographic magazine in 1985. McCurry's 30-plus year career has made him one of the most recognizable figures in modern-day photography. His resume includes books, magazines, and exhibitions worldwide. We're pleased to welcome Steve McCurry to this edition of Conversations. Thank you so very much for joining us. My pleasure. I have to ask you, how did photography begin for you? Where did the interest come from? Well, I had an uncle when I was just growing up. I was maybe eight years old who had a camera. He had a dark room. Uh, and I was just fascinated with the whole process. Uh, I had a brownie, I had a small little camera, which I took to camp and all that. But then I kind of drifted away from any idea of being a photographer. And, and when I was 19, I lived in Sweden uh, for two or three months. I was in Europe for the right. entire year. And uh, I was living with this family, and, and the, the boy in the family was a kind of amateur photographer. So we used to go out on the weekends and shoot pictures. Uh, and that's what really, I think, got me hooked. Uh, I, I had traveled since I was 19. I, I went, my big ambition in life was just to travel for forever. Right. But I didn't have really have a purpose. I didn't really have, I mean, I wanted to travel, but it was just sort of random kind of wanderings. Right. Until I discovered photography and I realized, okay, I can, I can travel and photograph and like do this forever. And I thought if I could kind of team up with a magazine like National Geographic, this would be the, this would be perfect. Right, right. Um, you know, I went worked on a newspaper. I did that for three or four years. Got kind of a bit bored with it because it was so repetitive. Uh, I saved my money and bought a one-way ticket to India, thinking, you know, this is going to sink or swim. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to try and freelance, I'm gonna try and build a portfolio to eventually take the National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And I spent, I spent two years on that project, just uh, traveling, staying in cheap hotels, taking the bus, uh, and uh, hone my skills. I never shot color, mm -hmm. so I was actually shooting color for the first time. Uh, after two years, I, well, in that period, just by sheer coincidence, I met some Afghan refugees mm -hmm. in a small village in Pakistan. And they explained that there was this war raging in their country, which was literally just a half a day's walk from where I was staying. And they said, we need somebody, you're a photographer, we need somebody to tell this story because nobody seems to know what's happening. Our villages are being bombed, uh, refugees are you know, being, mm -hmm. uh, flowing out of our country. Uh, so I kind of reluctantly went in with them and made some photographs. And that was really my kind of big break because seven months later, uh, the Russians invaded and suddenly those pictures I had became very valuable because it really was one of the very few looks mm -hmm. at uh, the beginning of this sort of you know ins insurrection or rebellion or whatever you call it. Uh, so suddenly my pictures were being published in the New York Times, Time Magazine, uh, major European publications. Uh, National Geographic mm -hmm. noticed that there's this guy you know, that's running around Afghanistan yeah. with these pictures. They called me up and said, we'd like to look at your portfolio and maybe give you an assignment. So I thought, you know, this is perfect. Right. Uh, this is exactly what I want to you know, do. So I went down there, and I, I thought I had, I had lunch with the editor, the director of photography, and a series of editors. And uh, 
I, I thought I had completely uh, blown the, the 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 interview. I thought that you know, they, they, so I went went home. I thought, well, that's not going to happen. Two weeks later, I get a call from the director of photography, Bob Gilkett, saying, not only do we want to give you one assignment, we want to give you two. Wow. <laughs> so that was really kind of how I I got into it, uh, and I literally kept the ball rolling with National Geographic from 1980 until today. I've been working almost constantly for this, the best photograph ma photographic magazine yeah. in, in the world, maybe the ever was. The picture of the Afghan girl, I mean, is so iconic. Tell me the story. How did that come about? Well, because of my trips in Afghanistan, I, I'd been to Afghanistan maybe 15 times. So they, they said, we want to do a story on the Afghan-Pakistan border. There were two or three million Afghans that had had forced out of Afghanistan in the, in the Pakistan. So my assignment was to photograph all these camps, the uh, stream of Afghans coming out of their country, and to go into Afghanistan and to show the villages were being decimated. Um, so I, one morning I was wandering through this refugee camp outside of Peshawar. It was 11 o'clock in the morning, very bright, and I, I heard uh, voices coming from one of the tents. And it, it were a girl's voice, and I, I realized it was a school. It was an elementary school for young girls. So I went over, and I, I looked in, and I saw the teacher, and I asked her if I could come in and uh, see what was happening and take some pictures. So she agreed. And uh, I, I immediately saw this one little girl with this incredible face and these very piercing kind of green eyes. And I thought, oh my God, this is an amazing face. And I, I have to photograph this girl. But you know, photographing girls and women in this part of the world is, is very difficult. So I thought, and I, I knew that I, if she said no, that I, I may not get a second chance. So what I did was I decided to, I took some general pictures mm -hmm. of the class. Then I asked the teacher if I could photograph certain girls. And I, I created the situation where I thought, I, eventually she's gonna feel excluded. And because I photographed all her classmates, so I photographed all these other girls. And eventually I, I asked the teacher, can I, you know, I'd like to photograph this little girl. So I'm sure she agreed because, uh, you know, she, she didn't want to be excluded. Right. So at first she was a bit shy. Um, she had her, her, her hands over her, over her, her mouth and her, and uh, the teacher said, no, no, let, let this man take your picture because the world needs to know what's happening in our country, the fact that we've all been driven out, you know, driven into these camps. So she put her hands down and I refocused the camera and, and shot 10, pictures or whatever. And, and she was looking into my, into my lens um, probably as curious about me as I was about her because you know, here I'm this strange foreigner uh, dressed in a funny way, speaking a different language right. with this camera. She never had her picture taken in her life. And so she had this kind of really piercing look. Uh, but there's a, kind of a hint of sadness in her eyes, yeah. I thought. It, yeah, she was an orphan and a refugee uh, living in this really awful conditions. And, and I'm sure life was very difficult for her, but she had this sort of, um, there's, a, there's a dignity and, and kind of resilience and a fortitude in her look, I think. Um, I mean, it's a picture which, you know, as hard as you try to duplicate that or replicate that, it's just you can't do it. There's a, there's a genuine... Uh, authentic quality to that emotion and to that look, which is, she's not, it's a kind of an ambiguity. She's not, uh, she's not smiling and she's not really, doesn't look sad, but there's this really penetrating look, which, uh, and people, I, we've gotten thousands of letters from people all over the world Wanting to know, you know, who is she? We know we know who she is now, right? But uh, people wanted to help her, send her money. You know, there were men wanted to marry her. There's this outpouring of interest 
about this little girl, and it's just astonishing, you know? How old was she at the time? She was uh, 12. Uh, in, in Afghanistan at, at that time, it was, um, it was permissible to photograph uh, young girls until puberty. So there was no restriction. After puberty, of course, it's, it's completely taboo to photograph women for, for a man. So at that age, she was just changing. She was just a 12. And so I had, you know, the whole school classroom was of these young girls, so I was able to photograph her. Of course, uh, f photographing women is just completely out of the question. Right. And you really are taking your life in your own hands if you walk around the streets of, say, Kabul and, and photograph without permission. I mean, people get very offended, and I've had men uh, draw their rifles and, oh, and pistols and, and, and kind of get very angry about the fact that they perceive that I pointed the camera in the direction of their wife. Or Go back to the Afghan girl for just a moment. You, I guess, just sort of lost contact, but then you were able to go back years later and meet her. Tell me the story. How did that come about and what happened and what did you find? Well, after 9-11, the, kind of the world's attention turned to Afghanistan because that's where bin Laden right. had hatched this whole plan. So I, I got together with National Geographic and I, we thought, why don't I, since I've done all these assignments and all these trips to Afghanistan, I'll go back and see what Afghanistan is like post 9-11. So that was really the main assignment. We thought, let's start the assignment, let's start the trip off by going back to where I photographed the Afghan girl and see if there's anybody that would remember her. We'll spend a week or 10 days on that, and then we'll go to Kabul, to this Afghan, Af Afghanistan at post 9-11. Then we're going to go visit the Dalai Lama and get his take on kind of world peace and kind of sum up the... So we started off going back to where I photographed the Afghan girl, and we got, we got very lucky because we met some of the people that knew her. And we thought we would we should just kind of stay on this. So we uh, started a full search, full blown search, and eventually uh, we found her brother, who in turn led us to her. I mean, I never in a million years believed that we would actually find this girl. I never, I thought it'd be impossible. We didn't have her name, we didn't have her address, we didn't know her tribe. She could have been anywhere. She could have been dead, mm -hmm. in fact. Uh, so we, we, we just got very lucky, and we were just like a miracle. Her name is Sharbat Gula? Sharbat Gula. Okay. And, and when she met you the second time around, did she realize the impact that original photo had had globally? Well, you know, she's uh, still illiterate, and she had never heard of National Geographic, didn't okay. have a television, didn't read newspapers or magazines. So she had no idea that her picture had been published even once, let alone, you know, millions of, literally millions of times. And when we finally met her, she said, well, like, you know, what's all the fuss about? You know, what's the big deal? I mean, she didn't understand that uh, her, her picture on the cover of National Geographic had reached like 10 million mm. people, and that subsequently the picture had been republished and other National Geographic magazines, maybe up to about a hundred million times that her picture had been around the world. Uh, so, you know, well, the first thing we wanted to talk to her about was, you know, we want to help you, we want to compensate you for the use of that picture. We've, I've benefited, National Geographic has benefited. We want to, we want to compensate you for the use of that picture. That that's happened right away. Mm -hmm. um, she, she was married, had a, a, a three children, and so that was kind of what we got into. And um, her husband was a, worked in a bakery making one dollar a day. So they were in, uh, I mean, you know, poor but sure. reasonably happy family. Do you ever think to yourself, and I, I couldn't help but think about this as I researched, if this 
if this young lady had been born in the United States of America or Europe or Japan or somewhere like that and that photograph had become that iconic, I mean, how wealthy would she be? How famous would she be? I mean, you ever think about that? I mean, just for the grace of God, where you're born. You know, I think about that all the time because I was just in Ethiopia and I met, uh, photographed some stunningly beautiful uh, young women who, you know, the, the right height and the right look. And in the case of Sharbat Gula, uh, you know, she could have capitalized on that. In mm -hmm. fact, she could have capitalized on it after we uh, rediscovered her. Mm -hmm. She could have uh, become uh, like a, an ambassador for peace around the world, and she could have, uh, but she just chose to stay home. But the, the, the yeah, the, where you're born and, you know, in, in the case of her or some other girls that mm. they, they're shepherds, they're work in the home, they live in these lives, which uh, I, I've, I've, you know, um, the, the, the difference between them and, you know, uh, some of these models is it's just wafer thin in terms of the, how they look, and yeah. yet one is, you know, tens of millions of dollars and famous, and the other one is herding sheep in the mountains of Afghanistan. Just makes you realize how grateful we all should be living Absolutely. in this country. Yeah, absolutely. Let me shift over to you as a photographer. When you go out on an assignment, what do you look for? What, what I don't know for lack of a better term, what really inspires you? What, does, you know, what is it that you like? I want to go to places that fascinate me, that places that I want to learn about, places that, um, places like Burma or India. Uh, places that transport me to uh, another time or another culture, uh, another people doing things in, in a different way than what we do. Um, everybody fishes, everybody farms, everybody, uh, you know, we, but, but they, everybody does it in, in a different way. Um, in Sri Lanka, they sit on these poles in, in the middle of, you know, out in the sea, and catch fish sitting on a, on a pole. It's, a, it's an incredible yeah. technique. Uh, so it's just for me, uh, I, I choose places that uh, I want to go even without the camera. I mean, I think the, the best places and the best experiences are, are, are places that you would want to go even without the camera. That it would be an, like walking through the streets of Rome or, or, or Kathmandu or Rangoon. I mean, just to be there is enough, but then to be able to actually record and actually, you know, make pictures and have this kind of creative processes. Something that I've noticed about many of your photographs, and I'm curious, um, is this just me or is this purpose of, purposeful on your part? You seem to, to capture something in people's eyes. It seems to me like there's a story in so many of your photographs in people's eyes. Is that mm -hmm. true? Well, I think in port, I love portraiture. I love human behavior. I love, you know, the human face. We all have the same face, but it's always a kind of a variation right. on the theme. Uh, and so much a person's kind of life story is often written in their face. So I, I, I love portraiture and photographing people. And for me, the most logical way to do that is to have them look into my lens. I mean, to me, I, I can't imagine wanting to photograph somebody and, and asking them to look here, look there, or pretend that, you know, that they're not. I, to me, the most logical and the strongest way to make a portrait is just have a person to look directly into the lens. I think that's the best way you get to know somebody is through that intimate eye contact. So to me, the, the, the eyes are so expressive and really tell so, a great part of the story of who we are. Interesting. Where do we draw the line as reporters or journalists or photographers? Where do we draw the line between recording history and being just overdoing it, putting stuff out there that we should not um, for profit and things of that nature? Where, where is that line? I mean, there's been a lot of talk recently about some of the published pictures with the journalist who um, was killed by ISIS. Where, where is that line? 
Well, I think the, I think the, that there, I mean, there's always every moment when you're out there in the field, you know, do, do I photograph this situation? Is this, is this too private? Is, am I invading somebody's, you know, personal space? It's a moment to moment. And you just have to have an inner kind of uh, conscience or kind of balance uh, and, and always say, you know, what's the right thing to do, you know, and, and it's always different moment to moment. Sometimes you take the picture and sometimes you don't. I think in the case of uh, the execution of, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think it's important that we have that information, that that, that, that you know, I think we need to know what these people are up to. Um, but I, 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 I've never, uh, for me, when, when I feel that I'm, uh, I wouldn't, when I, when I, when, uh, I don't photograph if I think that if I was in their shoes, I wouldn't want to be, have the picture. So I, I kind of back off sometimes because I think this is, this is pushing it too much and I don't want to disturb people's, you know. Other times, it's just, you know, we just have to know the story. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the, we just have to, these, the information about these, you know, important, pivotal places in the world and what's happening. Just the st we have to have that information. Mm -hmm. Journalists have to report because that's the only way we're going to know what's going on. Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, we, we have to know to, in order to evaluate and to respond and put pressure on our politicians to act. Yeah. Let me bring up a couple of your photos here, and I just want you to give me a little feedback on them. The Yemen image, tell me about it. Which one was a uh, well the the one with the lady with the full face and just the eyes oh, yeah. showing? Here. Yeah, yeah. I, I was in. A, I was there was a, during the election period, um, and I was at a polling station. First of all, again, impossible to photograph women in Yemen, just out of the question. Uh, there's always an exception, though, and I went to the polling station, and the woman who was kind of running managing the polling station was this woman with this incredible, beautiful eyes and just this kind of slit. And I asked her if I could take her picture. I guess she felt like she was out there in public and she agreed. But um, powerful eyes. I mean, yeah. really amazing, really spectacular. Another one I enjoyed a lot is the elephant sitting by the gentleman reading. Oh, right, how did, yeah. how did that come about? <laughs> Well, I, I love uh, animals, and I when I'm in Thailand, I went to a, uh, I went to like an animal kind of an elephant park, and uh, they have these trainers who work with the elephants, and this was a young elephant, and he was kind of playful, and his trainer was just sitting there reading a book, and this little elephant came over and sort of rubbed up on this rock, and uh, it, it almost looks as though he's uh, looking over his shoulder. And, and you know, trying to read the book too, <laughs> but it, yeah, you catch these moments. You get these, and and, and it tells a story, and, and it's it's just a sliver. It's just a moment in time, and if you're not fast enough, you miss it. What about Kuwait? The the picture you have of the Kuwait oil fields and the camels in in the foreground there. I, I was on a National Geographic story on it was an environmental piece on the aftermath of the Gulf War, and I saw these camels running through the desert and they were all covered in oil, they were black and there was always black smoke. But it was they were obviously looking for water or food or a way to escape. So I started following them with my with my Jeep. And we followed them. I, I I knew that they wouldn't be visible, the black on black. So I sat on the hood of my car, I had my assistant drive me, so we're racing through the desert and eventually they came in front of this fire, just for a moment. And they were silhouetted against this incredible fire, and I just shot like two pictures, and that was the picture that was just for a moment. And then we realized that we were in a minefield, <laughs> and so we had to actually drive out, uh, you know, on the same tire tracks we had come in on, because there were all these mines everywhere. I'm getting a little short on time, but I do want to get your thoughts on 9/11 because you evidently photographed um, some of that. What was that like? Well, I'd just come back from a month in Tibet. Very peaceful, very serene. I was in this kind of Buddhist vibe. I get back, uh, I was exhausted, go to sleep, woke up the next morning, September the 11th. I'm opening up my mail in my office, get a call. 
the World Trade Center's on fire, I look out the window and I saw both towers on fire. I, I ran up on the roof, started photographing, I thought, okay, it's a fire, It'll, you know, I'll put it out in a few minutes, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then to our horror, the first tower collapsed. And I just thought, this is a dream. But my brain couldn't process, I thought that this is impossible. And the smoke cleared and the tower wasn't there. It was just one time I thought, this is just, this is, this is impossible, this can't be happening. Then I, I kept shooting and then the second tower went down. And, and I just thought, you know, I have, I have to go down to ground. So somebody has to document what's going on because I, that's, that's what I do. And I thought that this is happening in my, basically in my neighborhood. Right. So I went down there and spent the entire day, went back the next day and re you know, photographed again. It was just, and the smell of that smoke would come up into, up into my neighborhood and it was just, uh, to, to watch those towers go down and to know the amount of people that were in the, inside the buildings and the fire. And, and you know, whenever these kind of things happen, it always draws all the, the, you know, the first responders. I just knew that everybody was lost in the building and for like a block around. It was just the worst day of my life. I can imagine so. I only have about two minutes left. As we look ahead in your career, what's next? Well, you know, my ambition is just to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. I have some books I want to do. I want to, some new places I want to go. Um, I, and that, that's, that's just to keep traveling um, uh, and, and, and just sort of exploring and wandering and, and uh, enjoying life. Any advice for aspiring photographers? Photograph what you love. Uh, be passionate about your work, learn about the history of photography. That may sound a bit boring, mm -hmm. but there's some spectacular work that's gone on in the last 100 years, which you, you really need to know about because we can learn so much from how they handled light and composition and all that, so that's an important. And, and, and I know all the hardcore photographers out there want me to ask this question, digital or film? Oh, digital. I have no nostalgia for film. Digital is, is so much better uh, that, that, that there's no uh, n no debate. <laughs> what a pleasure visiting with you. Best of luck in your career. Thank you very much. Steve McCurry, world-renowned photographer. By the way, you can learn more about and also follow Steve online at stevemccurry.com. And you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations, also on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you so very much for watching. I'm Jeff Weeks. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take great care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.